Psalm 103, which is one of my favorite psalms, and it says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, all my inmost being. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases, who redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with glory and honor. That's the God that we're serving this morning. And I'm excited to bring you a word this morning, and my message is entitled, New Wine. And it's taking place in the second, second chapter of John, and it's the first miracle that Jesus did. And maybe if you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2, and I'm reading from the first verse, and it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. That's about 75 to 115 liters. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Gaina of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And the disciples believed in him. So the story starts out, and this is the very first miracle that Jesus does. And John calls it a sign. And a sign, friends, can be almost called a miracle with a message. And as I read that text, for me, the primary message of it is this, that it speaks about a conversion from the old life into the new that God has called us to. And when you look at it, it's, for me, it starts out at a marriage, and it's amazing that it's a marriage because one of the first institutions that God blessed was the marriage when he said, be fruitful and multiply. I wonder, I wonder if you can show a picture that I sent in this morning. That was a picture that my wife sent me. Now, you're thinking, why on earth am I showing you that picture? Okay, you can take it off. <laughs> <laughs> but I was having a particularly bad week, <laughs> and my wife sent me that picture, and she said on our family chat, she said, babe, that's what lo- rock bottom looks like. Cheer up. Everything will be okay. And friends, what I want to say this morning is that the God of the hills is also the God of the valleys. The God of the good times is also the God of the bad times. And the story starts out of a marriage because it gives us a picture that at the end of time, it's not going to be a sad time in the kingdom of God, but it's going to be a celebration. It's going to be a happy time. And sometimes we might go through difficulties But God says, cherish cherish your marriage this morning. But when you read the story, it's not only for marriages, but it's for all relationships. I love when you read the text, it says, Jesus' mother was there. And somebody might be saying this morning, yo, you haven't met my mother-in-law. If she was there, she would have turned that wedding upside down. (laughs) But God is saying to us this morning, cherish our relationships. You know, for some of the, for there's a scripture in Proverbs 15 that says, a a gentle answer turns away wrath. And so often, maybe as an older generation, we lost one of our moms this year, and it was just a picture for us to cherish our relationships. 
And maybe this morning I want to thank some of the older folks. There's some people that have been praying for this church for decades. And I just want to say thank you to you this morning. And as you read that story, you might think, well, Jesus was being a little bit harsh with his mother, but the fact is it was maybe a gentle rebuff because when you read scripture, even the angels use the language of woman. And even in John chapter 19, when when Jesus hands over uh, his mother to, to John to look after, he says, this is now your mother. And maybe for the younger people, sometimes mom and dad might be telling you stuff and you're getting very irritated. But can I say that they know better? I remember as a young man, my dad waking me up very early in the morning. And I used to think, what's wrong with this dad of mine? Doesn't he know that I want to sleep? But he showed me the value of work. He showed me that we need to work. And it was winter and it was in Coxton and it was cold. But I understood the value of work. And as I go through life, sometimes I remember getting my driver's license. And he, 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 he always used to tell me, my son, when you get to this part of the road, you see this corner here? It's a dangerous corner. And can I say to the young people this morning that your parents, you might not always agree with them, but they do know what they're talking about. They say, sometimes, well, I want to experience things. Sometimes, can I say this, it's better to live from, to understand from the experience of others than to go through some of the pain ourselves. But the story, this whole story about turning the water into wine is about God saying the old is gone, the new has come in. The new has come in. As I read the story, I believe that God wants to share with us this morning that it's a season and a time for us for absolute obedience. It says, he says to the servants, the mother says, do whatever he tells you. And that word, do whatever he tells you. It didn't say, uh, think about what he tells you. Meditate necessarily on what he tells you. Discuss what he tells you. Do what he tells you. If we're honest with each other, many times we're not very good at following instructions. Sometimes I'll say to my wife, where is that uh, gadget that I'm looking for? And she'll say, look in the cupboard on the second shelf. And if you ever open the cupboard and you're thinking to yourself, is there a secret compartment here that I don't know of? (laughs) And then inevitably she'll come and it's probably right in front of me and I didn't see it. But do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. When I read the Bible, there are two stories particularly that remind me of maybe not following instructions like we should. The one is found is the King Saul in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15. And Saul comes, and and Samuel comes to Saul and he says, I want you to go and destroy all the Amalekites because they treated, they attacked Egypt, they attacked Israel while they were coming out of Egypt. And he says, destroy everything, the the houses, the fields, the cows, the sheep, you name it. And what does Saul do? He gets there. He First of all, he saves the king, (laughs) the king of the Amalekites. Secondly, he doesn't kill all the sheep and the fatlings. I'm assuming he probably thought it was a merino sheep or something. He said, there's no ways I can kill this. And then Samuel comes to him grieved and he says, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And he says, but, but, but I did everything that the Lord asked me. And Samuel says then, what are these sheep that I hear blaring in the background? He who has ears, let him hear this morning. (laughs) Hallelujah. And Samuel says this, he says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. As we listen to that message this morning, God is saying, I want to pour out new wine, new perspective into our situations. I think of the father of the faith, Abraham. God appears to him in Genesis chapter 12 and he says, I want you to leave your mother and your father and your household and go to a land that I will show you. Go to a land that I will show you. And it says in that verse, and it says this, so Abraham left as the Lord had told him. It should have been full stop. But it says, and Lot went with 
You see, friends, Abraham had an instruction from God, but he didn't follow through 100% what God was asking him to. And you know the story, Lot caused him a lot of problems. And it says in verse 14, after they split up, after they look and, 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 and Lot goes his separate ways, it says, the Lord said to Abraham, it says, it says, the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you look, from where you are, look north, south, east, and west, all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. And the picture was amazing that the promise of God came through the moment that person that was the obstacle in his life moved away. And maybe a question for us this morning is, what relationship is stopping us from stepping into the fullness of God? And I'm not talking necessarily now, so, you know, don't misinterpret me, say, okay, no, well, it's time for my marriage to end. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm talking about God is saying there's certain buses that we need to get off because it's stopping us from getting into the fullness of what he has called us to. The Bible says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that wedding was maybe getting stale and some things were not happening, but God says, I'm going to give you new wine. And I just feel this morning that God wants to start, get us to tap back into that heavenly supply that he's called us to. You see, the wedding was a prestigious occasion. And maybe we can say that um, there was maybe a social stigma attached to that family, that if they lost the wine or the wine got finished, that maybe people would look down on them. I mean, maybe if you go to a modern wedding, it's never a good sign if the wedding cake falls. People would say, oh, this wedding is not going to last. <laughs> And the natural response when the wine was finished was to say, well, the wine is finished. What are we going to do? It's late in the night. Lockdown has happened. All the shops are closed. Sorry to be speaking so much truth this morning. <laughs> Everything is going wrong. You see, friends, the challenge that they faced and the challenge that we are facing today is not going to, natural answers are not going to solve the challenges that we are facing. And as they were in that wedding, they came to a point where they said, what do we do? And Jesus' mother says, do whatever he tells you. And friends, can I say that so often when we receive a word from God, we would think that the word is to break us down, but it's actually to Lift us up. And I want to say this morning, well, how do we respond? And the only way we can respond is supernaturally. And Jesus says to them, fill the jars with water. And I love this. They said, so they fill them to the brim. So often when, when God comes to us, we'll say, okay, I'm going to do half of this and half of that. But I just believe that God's saying, fill it to the brim. Step out in the fullness that God has called us to. Step into the blessing that he's calling us to. Fill it to the brim. It says in the Bible, work it with all your heart as if working for the Lord. For we labor not in vain. Fill it to the brim. And they filled it. And I said, well, God, how do we experience your overflow this morning? Because sometimes we can come to church and still not get the overflow of what God is wanting to do for us. And I believe that God is saying this this morning. The first sub point this morning is don't be a stone. Now, I know someone's probably saying I want to be a rolling stone. <laughs> don't be a stone. In Hebrews 4, it says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You see, friends, when we preach a word or when you, when you sing a song, sing it with faith. Sing it and say, Lord, I believe you. It says that, that for, six days they, they, that for, for six days, God created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested. Funny that there were six stone jars. And I believe that it's a season for God saying us, I want you to enter my rest. How many know that you can be busy and, and still be at rest? 
And it's a season for us not just to be busy, but to be effective. And our effectiveness comes from saying, Lord Jesus, fill it to the brim. Fill it to overflowing. Taste and see that the Lord is God. For those wine connoisseurs that think they can make wine, can you imagine how good that wine must have been that the Son of God had made? Taste and see that the Lord is God. In Ezekiel it speaks and it says, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the hearts of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. The Lord is saying that when you come into his presence, he wants to continually renew you with new wine from heaven. For some of us, we're still on the old wine, meaning that we haven't come to experience the fullness and the love and the joy that God provides us. For some of us, God is saying, I want to pour more wine into you this morning by his Holy Spirit. I want to pour a renewing over you this morning. God is saying that we need to position ourselves. We need to position ourselves to receive from heaven. They lined up those stone jars. And friends, how many know that it's not necessarily the jars that changed the stone, but it was the content that changed. And God is saying that we are like earthen vessels. Treasure in earthen vessels. And it says, so that the excellency of the power may be of God. God is saying, position yourselves. And when you read the story, you'll say, well, how do I position ourselves? Well, I love Mary. She says, We've, we have no more wine. She's making a statement because she understands that Jesus has got the power to change the situation. Jesus this morning has got the power to change your situation. If you maybe analyze it a bit more, you can almost say, she says, Jesus, maybe indirectly, and this is my own theology, do you think you can help us with more wine for these people? And some of you might say, well, why did he make so much wine? That's hundreds of liters of wine that Jesus want everybody to be drunk. Well, in those days, the wedding didn't last a day. It lasted a week. So you can imagine Jesus giving an overflow, and I'm sure that might have been even a blessing. Remember the story of the jars in the Old Testament where the lady had one small jar of oil. And, and Elisha says to get as many containers as you can. And the amazing thing is that the containers ran out before the oil ran out. God is giving us a capacity, and he says, I will continue to pour out new wine. And the new wine never gets finished. You see, friends, when we ask, we should ask according to his will. You see, the foundation and authority of our prayers is his will. It says in 1 John 5 verse 14, this is the confidence that we have, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we have whatever we ask of him. Friends, God doesn't just want you to ask for the year. And now Mary wasn't focused on, can you make a small cup for me and my family? She had the focus of the nations. She had the focus of the entire marriage. And what does God say? Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. And for us, it's a time and a season to ask bigger and greater than our own need and our circumstances. It's a time to say, oh Lord, I pray, Father, for the nations. And Mary understood that. David wrote, he said, turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. It's interesting that in this, in this marriage, it was a community. The entire village was invited to this, to this wedding where Jesus is turning the water into wine. And I think the first thing that they did right at this wedding was they invited Jesus. And many times we might get a whole lot of things wrong, but the main thing is, Jesus, I want to invite you first. 
first in every decision, first in every idea, first in anything and everything. And I love the fact that Jesus does this miracle in community. When he feeds the 5,000, he does it in community. And you hear us keep drumming away, connect groups, connect groups, connect groups. Because friends, can I tell you that your miracle, you'll experience it more often in community. Someone to pray with you. Someone to stand with you. Someone to speak with you. So often our isolation is a step towards desolation. In Acts 2 verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That word fellowship, the Greek word is kononia, which means sharing unity, close association, participation. Friends, we are members of the body of Christ. And I believe that as I read that story, God is saying not just new wine, but new wineskins. New wineskins. In Mark 2 verse, 20, it said, 2 verse 22, it says, And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And I believe it. God is saying, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's a time to say, Lord, help me to see things the way you see them. Help me to think new ideas. Help me to get new understanding. Einstein wrote, and he said, the height of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. New wineskins. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Can we pray this morning, say, God, transform our minds. Give us a heart and a mind after you. But when I, when I read the story about the water into wine, I, I, I just sense that God is saying that the best is still to come. We might think that the story is just focusing on the water to wine, but it's actually a focus of Jesus at the center of it all. It's a picture of Jesus coming into the new way of life, the, the law being put aside and, the, and, and grace taking hold. Focus on Jesus this morning. It says everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Can I say, friends, that your best days are still ahead of you and not behind? You might not feel like that this morning, but God is saying your best days are still to come. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The sustainer and the giver of life. And I want to leave you just with seven quick points as I finish up this morning. What do we receive when we have Jesus? The seven promises of those who follow Jesus are as follows. One is life. It says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. The second one is acceptance. It says, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. John 6, verse 37. Can I say, friends, that when you come to Jesus this morning, he will never drive you away. It says a bruising reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Can I say that that smoldering wick, for, the, for, for those that don't know, the olden days they had a lamp with that small little cloth that was called a wick. And if it was on for too long, it starts smoking. And you had to change it and just throw it away. And God is saying, you are so precious that he will never throw you away. The third is reward. Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. The fourth thing is revelation. You see, those, those servants saw the revelation of Jesus. 
It's, it's interesting that the master of the banquet didn't actually know what was happening. You see, friends, when you are converted to Christ, sometimes people won't understand your joy and your excitement because it's something that happened internally and they changed that whole situation by the word of Jesus and the servants that followed the instructions. And we, in today's world, change the world by the word of God and being the servants in the kingdom. Number five is a friendship with God. The Bible says that we are no longer servants. He has called us friends. Number six is joy. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This morning the Lord is saying that when we're in him, we have joy. For some of us this morning, my prayer is, Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. You see, in the natural, it was just water, but in the supernatural, God says it was wine and outpouring of his spirit. And this morning, receive that outpouring of his spirit. And the last one was trials. Maybe not a famous teaching because it says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus, will be persecuted. The Bible says, take heart. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. New wine for us this morning. Maybe we can stand. If I can ask every eye to close this morning. The whole aim of the new wine that Jesus spoke about was to say that I want to give you newness of life. We heard last week about the book of life where they opened the book of life and those whose names were found there joined in the wedding banquet at the end of time. John wrote this. He said, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Every eye closed this morning. I, will not, I can't close the meeting this morning without giving you an opportunity to respond. If there's someone here this morning that does not have a relationship with the Lord, now is your time. Now is the time to receive the new wine. Maybe if you can put up your hand, I'll appreciate that. Every eye closed. Is there anybody like here? Is there anybody like that here this morning? I'd love to pray with you. I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. It's a special, special moment. Is there anybody else? I see you, but more importantly, God sees you. Maybe you're at home this morning. Maybe you're watching for the first time online. Maybe God is speaking directly to you this morning. Right there where you are, close our eyes. Let's just pray, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for me. And that you were raised to life, Lord, and you took all my punishment. All, everything that I deserved on, on yourself so that I may be free. Lord Jesus, I pray, come into my heart now and make everything anew. And if you've prayed that prayer this morning, tell a friend, phone a friend, phone someone that you know. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. And I pray for new wine for your people. New wine like never before. In Jesus' name, amen.